Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mirror of Intimacy webinar. I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, and today is Monday, December 13th, as we're coming down the home stretch of 2021. Our topic today is change, which is a favorite topic of mine. And I want to remind all of you um, that you can find Mirror of Intimacy on Amazon.com. If you just type in the title of the book, it'll take you to our page. And anytime you leave a review, we're terribly grateful for that and appreciative of you um, supporting the book and the webinars as well. I want to remind you also that you can follow us on Instagram um, and that we're going to be talking about change all month long on all of our social media platforms since we're headed into a new year and a new year always um, exemplifies change. Our quote of the day today is, we are not the same persons this year as last, nor are we, uh, nor are those we love. It is a happy chance if we changing continue to love a changed person. And that's by Somerset Mon. So I'll read that again and also remind you that um, if you put questions into the Q&A box, um, Elisa will get those to me and I'll be able to see them um, and answer them for you if possible. So I'm going to read that quote again since I kind of goofed it. He says, we are not the same persons this year as last. And when you think about that, we're actually changing moment by moment, day by day, month by month, year by year, sometimes in imperceptible ways and sometimes in really um, quite radical ways that we notice. Um, then he says, nor are those we love. So while we're changing moment by moment and sometimes radically, so are the people around us that we love. And it is a happy chance if we, changing, continue to love a changed person. And I honestly think that's where a lot of um, committed couples get into trouble, is that we sort of, if we're getting married in a traditional way, we're sort of tethered to this happily ever after story without any space for I'm going to love you in the face of you changing. And in fact, I want you to change and grow. And I want to challenge myself to be able to tolerate those changes and that growth so that we can grow together and change together, even though it may have us going in different directions sometimes. Uh, that's not the traditional model of marriage that most of us are fed. So this idea that we're going to change and those that we love are going to change and we're going to change together makes for a very interesting life together and certainly a challenging one as well. And change literally means to alter, um, to transform, to exchange or substitute something out. Like when we talk about, oh, I need a change of scenery. But if we're in the business of transformation and change, that means nothing is really staying the same. And I think for me, one of the most um, clear examples of this has been um, being in this pandemic for almost two years now. It seems like I entered the pandemic in a certain way and I was in a um, certain body at that time and I was feeling certain things. I was very, very stressed out. Um, I recall that 2019, February of 2019 was a very busy year for me professionally. And when everything stopped, I didn't realize how exhausted I actually was. And I know I'm not alone in this realization. A lot of people felt that. And not only that, we came into the pandemic with a certain socio-political um, culture or vibe going on, and we're coming out of it in a very different world. Um, many, many things have changed over these last two years. And so the world has changed, our culture has changed, we're changed. And how do we embrace that change? And what of it do we like? What of it do we want to expand on? And what of it do we want to uh, change? Or what don't we like about it? And I think whenever we go into the new year, it's useful to ask ourselves, what do I want to change going forward? What are my goals, in other words, for this new year? Um, more so than resolutions, because those seem to quickly fade or fall apart, but goals seem to be more substantive in this matter of change. And I think that uh, transformation may very well be an essential quality of life. It's certainly an, an essential quality of nature, and we see it in the seasons. 
Um, we see it, especially even here in Southern California, where it's been quite chilly for us. We're expecting a big rainstorm tomorrow. And when that happens, the temperatures drop and we all wear sweaters. And um, there's a sense of a seasonal change at this time, a time of introspection, a time of being indoors. Um, certainly with the Christmas holiday, um, there can be a coziness to that feeling as well, but it is the cycle of nature to constantly be transforming and transmuting and changing, and we have to trust and pay attention to the fact that we are going through these cyclical changes as well, and I think the seasons um, help us see it in more vivid color. So we need to keep a fluid sense of ourselves over time and really over a lifetime. And um, I've had two experiences in my life that I really recall where there were older people who said something that really struck me. One was a yoga teacher. Um, and at the time I was much younger and she was probably my age. And she said, um, I wanna be able to do more as I get older. And she meant more with her body. And certainly she could do more than anybody in the class. And she was probably 20 years older than everyone in the class. Um, and so that's a deep level of flexibility and a willingness to change. Um, and then a friend of mine told me that her 90 year old grandmother told her that she wanted to become more open-minded as she aged, not more close-minded. And that was really powerful for me. And it's something that I hold up as an aspiration. How do I start to be and challenge challenge my judgments, my assumptions? How do I keep changing in a way that has me more open, more available to possibility, um, and less collapsing and closing and afraid of change? So if we keep this fluid sense of ourselves, we're able to shift and change in that way. And think about any structure that is rigid, um, breaks. And there are even songs about this. Even, even a strong structure um, can be malleable enough to bend. And we know that with newer um, high-rise buildings and bridges, those structures are all bent, built to bend, uh, especially in California with earthquakes. Um, they're meant to be able to shift and change, even though they're pretty rigid looking structures, so that they don't snap and fall apart. And in the same way, having a supple vision for our relationship is key to keeping it alive and key to keeping it rich um, and sensual and fulfilling over time. And that means not seeing our partners as fixed. Um, we so often get into feeling like we just know our partner so well, or we are gonna finish their sentences for them. When the truth is, if we're really curious, if we're really open, we actually don't know that person at all today because I don't know about you, but I don't know what I want day to day, moment to moment. Um, sometimes in, I'm in the mood to eat something that I always eat and other times I'm not in the mood to eat that thing. And so if my partner assumed I wanted the same thing for lunch every day, they might be surprised to find out I don't want that at all. Um, and then they might feel like they can't get it right for me because they think they're giving me what I want, but they do it without actually really checking it out. And so we wanna permit changes. Um, and not hang on to these preconceived ideas, because if we don't permit for these changes, we will get a relational deadness. Um, and that's when people's desire falls off. Certainly sexual desire will fall off if we're not in these fluid states, these states of openness and curiosity that allow transformation and change to take place. And there's probably nothing more dynamic than a living, breathing relationship. And all too often couples come in for therapy and they're stuck um, and they're both stuck in their ways and they're stuck in their patterns because they're not letting the relationship expand and breathe. And it's really a lot like raising a child. When people raise secure children, they're curious about who the child in front of them is. They're not prescribing that this child should be a doctor or should be a real estate agent or should go to trade school. Instead, they're curious about what that child is putting forward into the world, what their interests are. 
Um, and I see this a lot where, you know, kids are expected to figure out what they want to do before they get to college, which is absurd. Um, instead of being interested in everything, what are you curious about? If you want to dye your hair pink, dye your hair pink. If you want to be in the theater, go for it. If you want to um, study science, you know, or photography, let's do that. And it doesn't mean your kid is going to be any of those things. It just means they're open to exploring who they are. And in that, you're building a capacity for flexibility and change, as opposed to projecting your own limitations onto your child by saying, oh, what do you want to do that for? That sounds dumb, or that's a waste of time. Um, instead, you're making a space for them. And likewise, we do the same thing to our partners. We judge what hobbies they might want to take up. Um, we sit in judgment of whatever it is that they're up to because we want them to be more like us. And I think there's probably no more of a boring relationship than having a partner that's exactly like me. Um, because then there would be nothing to push up against, nothing to learn from, actually, and no expansion of possibilities. So take a moment to think about, you know, what are the ways that you limit or shut down your partnership? Or what are the ways that you feel like your partnership limits you or shuts you down? And the myth of marrying young, as I said, and living happily ever after till death do us part, doesn't allow for the very rapid changes of modern life um, or for interesting long lifespans. And that phrase, may they live happily ever after, um, came, you know, at a time where people were dying of the plague, and there was no chance of longevity at that time, or very few people lived long, and many children died before they even got to be 16. So that phrase was a bit of a blessing, may they live happily ever after. Um, the key word in that was live more than anything. But today we live many different lifetimes. Um, there are some people that say that we live three different distinct lives. The first one being from the time we're born till we're 30 years old. Uh, that would be chapter one. Chapter two is 30 to 60. And chapter three is 60 to 90, if we're lucky, because people are living so long. So when you think about these three distinct chapters in our lives, um, and think about how do we allow for morphing and changing and growing. And if you marry somebody at 20, how can they possibly be the same person um, at 50 or 60 or then again at 80? Um, none of us are. And so do we give ourselves the space? Are we curious enough to ask ourselves, what do I like today? What has shifted and changed in me? Or do we continue to keep ourselves contracted and small. And I think probably the most important place to look at this is in our sex lives. Because what you liked in your 20s, the way you like to be touched, the style of sex, your willingness to be sexual in certain ways, definitely changes, you know, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, 50 years down the road. And do you ask yourself, what is the quality of my sex life like today? Am I satisfied? Am I satisfied with my orgasms? Am I satisfied with the way my partner touches me or the way I touch my partner? Um, am I satisfied with the level of affection, attention, touch while we're making love? Do you get granular about these things and get clear about, huh, I think I want something different now. And do you talk to your partner about it and have explicit conversations about it so that you can change together, so that you can continue to love a changed person, as Somerset Mon states? Um, this is probably the most important part to examine the changes in our body, the changes in our body's mood from day to day, week to week, month to month, um, and really communicate them in a way that just speaks to sexual pleasure, not so much what's going wrong in our sex life or who's doing something wrong, but what is the vision you have for the kind of sex life you want to have? What sort of changes do you want to make and how can you make those together 
um, as a couple. And if you're single, how do you communicate these desires to a lover and do it without shame and do it just part of really what it means to be consensual in sex? So if we're not diligent, really di diligent in tending to ourselves, um, we become stagnant, we become brittle, our sexual desire drops off because our sex life is boring. And then we wonder what happened to our love, what happened to our relationships, um, and we don't know where to go from here. And so it's really incumbent upon us to embrace this matter of change um, and to look at the ways that we can start to change ourselves. Um, someone writes, can you define what second order change is? Well, sure. Um, first order change is um, when you, uh, let me just use an, uh, an example of something like uh, drinking, you know, alcohol, for example. So first order change would be to stop drinking um, and to start to maybe go to 12 step meetings and to start to get into the habit of uh, calling people in the program to make sure that you don't drink again. So there are all the early changes that people make um, in order to make a change that they want to make. And second order change usually happens, you know, a good eight months, a year down the road, where we start to embody those things. We no longer have to work so hard um, to make those changes because they're just a part of who we are. And then we start to look more deeply at why maybe we started to drink to begin with, or why we became so isolated to begin with. And we start to work more on our psychological issues, which are really these adaptive strategies and patterns that we have. So second order change is about long-term change and growth. First order change is usually about symptom reduction. It's about stopping something or changing something that we don't want to do anymore. Um, another example I might use is somebody who, um, you know, flies off the handle, they rage. And so initially they're just working to stop doing that. So they probably go to a support group and they read books on rage and anger. And over time, they start to fundamentally change the structure and function in their brains um, so that they don't have that same tendency or it's not as much of a hair trigger as it once was. Um, so let's see, someone else has a question here. Um, so they're saying that uh, their partner has a masochistic fetish um, that has to do with submission and um, that this arousal template usually stays with the person over time, but other arousal templates can be strengthened. Um, this person thinks that this developed uh, by sexualizing through childhood trauma and says he doesn't want to keep that template alive. We're both hopeful that the template loses energy and trauma treatment. Is there any type of treatment or trauma work that is recommended for this kind of situation? Well, yes. I mean, you have to find a good trauma therapist is what I would recommend. Um, and when somebody works through that trauma, they're less likely to be engaging in behaviors that are that make them feel bad afterwards. But that doesn't mean that certain types are parts of that um, experience won't still be alive in them. And so we have to be very careful about um, pathologizing our tendencies because these tendencies are wired into the nervous system. So yes, a good trauma therapist should be able to um, help your partner with that question. And someone writes, what are a few practical strategies or suggestions for embracing change as a long-term couple together? Well, that's a very broad question, Robert. So I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. I mean, maybe it would be as something as simple as both of you writing down what it is you'd like to do differently than you're doing now. Like maybe once somebody wants to learn a foreign language and they want to go, you know, do an immersion course or they want to go live someplace while they learn that foreign language for two weeks or a month. And a month might really be a stretch on a relationship financially and distance away. But to write down what your most ardent desires are, like what is your dream, the thing that you most wanted to do? Maybe another person in that dyad wants to sail around the world or learn to surf or 
um, something else and not um, putting any restrictions on the list you make of what it is you want to do. And then being willing to share that list with each other without judgment, but with curiosity. So tell me more about why you want to live in Spain and learn Spanish and where exactly would you go? Um, and what about that is so appealing to you? And then likewise, if I was the person that wanted to sail around the world, tell you why that was a childhood dream or it reminded me of my grandfather who taught me to sail or what have you, or it's something I always promised myself I would do. And um, I think it's really important to share these things with each other and then to start to think about, well, how unusual would this be? And what would it be like if we gave each other the gift of that kind of space to go do that thing? And then what are the realities of it? What would it cost? How long would you be away? What type of time of month, et cetera, um, when you get into the nuts and bolts of it. But the first is really risking being vulnerable enough to say, this is what I want. And the second is being open enough and um, connected enough to not judge your partner about what they say they're wanting. And that list could hold true also for sex and sexuality um, about what's missing from your sex life, what you would like more of, what you would like to be bringing to your sex life, not what your partner's doing wrong, but what kind of sex life would you like to have? Um, and both of you to write what that vision for your sex life is, and then to share it with each other and to see how far apart you actually are. Uh, my wife is bi curious. How do we go about having experiences without it affecting our intimacy and connection? Uh, that also is a big question that comes under the rubric of ethical non monogamy. Um, if you're actually going to open up the relationship. Um, so I would re recommend that you start reading books about this topic um, and maybe find other ways to incorporate um, if you're not going to um, open your relationship where it includes other people, then finding ways to include fantasy that's arousing to her. Um, and maybe finding sex toys that um, help support that for her in one way or another. But the two of you have to be in a deep conversation about this because again, that's a major change to the system. Um, and how are you gonna negotiate these waters in a way that is kind um, and considerate and also tending to the security of the relationship. So not making any swift moves is the first thing to do that really taking time to think about this, to talk about it out loud, um, to maybe find a therapist that can help you have these conversations. Um, but uh, there are books that you can read about ethical non-monogamy that helps you get clear about what those contracts would be and what the relationship would look like if you did that. So you can see that change comes in many forms based on these questions. And um, we want to make sure that, you know, we have a vision for where we're going. Because if we don't, we're gonna get there haphazardly anyway. It's like, if you wanna to go to Hawaii on a boat, you can't just throw your boat into the Pacific Ocean and hope you'll end up there because you could end up all, any place in the world. You have to have a chart and a map and a direction um, and you have to have a plan for where you're headed. So all of these questions, whether it's about um, reintroducing masochism into a healthy sex life or what I would call submission, maybe not full, fully masochistic, um, uh, being bi-curious, um, trying different things. How do you, with good intention and a high level of consciousness, move into these conversations in a way that isn't shaming or blaming or threatening, but more from a place of kindness and curiosity? Uh, because oftentimes when we talk about these things, once we start to talk about them out loud, sometimes they're not as appealing as they thought we thought they were. But as a couple, we might land on something completely unexpected and surprising um, that we had no idea was going to come up for us. So when you stay open, anything can happen. 
Someone writes, what tools could you give me for stopping my automatic response, which comes off as judgmental, fear-based on past traumas, and listen more with curiosity and acceptance to my husband when he opens up about his anxiety and triggers with his sex addiction to me? Well, part of that is you being able to regulate yourself in the moment. And if you are listening to understand and listening to be curious then your attention and your empathy is on him. And then you will also still notice when you get triggered, you might get you know tightness in your chest or start to feel angry. Um, and in that moment, you might wanna say, you know what, I just need to stop for a minute and take a deep breath and get yourself regulated again before you go forward. If it's too much for you, if you're flooding, then that means something's really not right, that you actually don't want to hear whatever he's talking about, or you're not ready to hear it yet. Um, but this goes both ways. I mean, empathy is one of the key features for people who report that they have great sex. Um, connection, vulnerability, empathy, um, transparency, these are crucial, crucial aspects um, to having sex that's, you know, worth wanting to have, let's put it that way. And you can read more about that in um, the beautiful book, Magnificent Sex, um, by Peggy Kleinplatz, who is a researcher of sex in Canada, um, where she explicates what the eight factors are for having great sex. Um, but certainly being open is huge to that. We have to leave our judgments um, our own shame, all of that has to be left by the wayside or we can't really get anywhere. Someone writes here, um, if my partner, who presumably is a recovering sex addict and I get back together, any suggestions on returning to the home where our past 10 years of relationship trauma took place? Should we relocate to another area of the country and try somewhere new and how to find a good trauma therapist? Well, it's interesting that you are asking questions that are probably questions that you know the answer to. Um, so I don't think I'm the person to suggest that you relocate. That's a big, big um, move. And you want to be careful that you're not uh, pulling a geographic, as they say in AA, that, you know, no matter where you go, there you are. Um, if your partner is truly in recovery and you both have gone through the formal disclosure process and you're interested in uh, restoring your sexuality and starting your relationship anew and you make that commitment together, then it makes sense that you would want a space that felt fresh and new um, that was an outpicturing of what's happening inside of both of you. And um, so that's a conversation for the two of you to have, you know, at length. And then the way you find any good therapist, I think, is by interviewing people and setting appointments, you know, make an appointment with two or three different therapists. Um, when you get them on the phone, ask them how they work. Um, when a lot of people say they're trauma therapists, but what exactly does that mean? What modalities do they use? Um, can they help you with your problem and then go have a session with them. And in the session, they should, um, be doing some version of what they're going to be doing over time with you. Now, no one has a magic wand, so they're not going to be able to do trauma work with you for the entire session, but if they can give you an example of the way that you would be working, that would be helpful because talk therapy is not going to be that helpful. Uh, trauma therapists should be helping you locate feelings in the body um, because the body is where the trauma is and then helping you integrate those bodily-based feelings. Kate writes, my partner and I have been together for six and a half years and are getting married next year. We're very attracted to each other, but for the past couple of years have been both, ve both had very low libido and infrequent intercourse. Any tips for our libidos? Well, my guess is there's probably nothing wrong with your libido. It's just that sex starts to get boring when we have sex in the same way over and over again. So I would highly recommend that you consider starting with touch, with just simple touch with each other um, and noticing what it feels like to be touched, noticing what kind of pressure you like, um, where you don't wanna be touched, where you do wanna be touched, 
and taking turns with each other in these simple ways to start to understand the landscape of each other's bodies. And touch itself can be very, very arousing. And maybe you'll have sex and maybe you won't. But if you stop thinking about this notion that you have to perform, that you have to have penetrative sex, and you get curious about all the other ways you can be sensual with each other, then you might start to have a renewed type of sexuality. Uh, Mark writes, Ma Michael Pollan wrote a book on psychedelic drugs entitled How to Change Your Mind. Do you have any thoughts or experience on the use or benefits of psychedelic assisted therapy for affecting mental changes for the improvement of mental health? Well, I'm not a psychedelic assistant, assisted therapy. Um, what I've read um, shows many, many promising results from psychedelics. But um, what Michael Pollan also says is that, you know, the long haul experience of what psychedelics bring us is meditation and mindfulness practices. Um, so this, the only way to have that experience over and over and over again is through daily meditation practices. Um, and yes, the psychedelics are very powerful for disinhibiting the brain in a particular way that allows a lot of affective material, repressed memories, sometimes dissociative states to become more integrated. And I think what's key is finding a skilled practitioner um, that you can trust, who can walk you through these processes. I don't think this is a do-it-yourself job, and I don't think that you are um, suggesting that either, but um, find a therapist who's been doing this work, who's certified. Um, it's a relatively new field, so you won't find people that have been certified for a very long time, I don't think. Um, but I know if you probably go to the MAPS uh, website, um, I don't know exactly um, what the URL for that would be, but um, if you Google MAPS, uh, medically assisted psychedelics or something along those lines, I'm probably getting that wrong, you should be able to find a practitioner. So these changes we're talking about are small changes. They don't take a lot of work. You know, so often people come into therapy and their sex lives are broken and everything's wrong and it's not working. Um, and the truth is um, these are not big changes. If you get your attention off of what's broken and not working and start to put your attention on the changes you want to make, and then you are brave enough to actually start that conversation, that changes everything. I noticed that Melissa just put the URL in the chat box. It's Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. So I really goof that up, apologies. <laughs> um, I should know that, but I can't remember. Um, so <laughs> that is a way to um, you know, start to make intense internal changes. Um, but these little changes, I think, is what we're starting to see in the field of psychology. Um, and I, there are even books now about atomic changes, little things, five minutes a day. You know, there are apps now for learning a language, five minutes a day, 15 minutes a day. Um, these are so much more doable and digestible for the busy worlds that we live in. So don't think about change like, uh, well, just the idea, like I've, I've got to get in shape, right? Oh my God, what is that going to take? But if it just takes going for a walk five minutes a day, right? That was sort of the revolutionary thing about counting steps. All of a sudden people were moving their bodies, counting steps didn't take that long. Likewise with intermittent fasting, you just don't eat at night and lo and behold, people started losing weight a lot. Um, so these are not big measures that you have to make in terms of your love life and your sex life. They're tiny little things that you can do every day. And these achievements give us a big sense of accomplishment, even though they're small measures, because they add up. 365 days goes by in a snap, as evidenced by it being December already, and it will be January 1st before we know it, and so it goes. So this can leave us with a sense of accomplishment if we're doing one little thing every day or starting one small conversation a day. And newness is always on the horizon for us. Um, we can feel like, oh, I'm not getting anything done, or these are such small motions. Um, I can't, I don't, it doesn't seem like anything's happening. But if you do what um, 
I just, uh, I just had the name of somebody in my head that just went out of my head. Um, but if every day you look at what you have accomplished, I'll put it that way. What have I accomplished today? Go back and review your day. What one small thing did you do today? Um, did you work out today? Did you count your steps today? Did you eat healthfully today? Did you study your language for 10 minutes on your app today? Did you make um, a list of the ways that you want to be touched and the ways you don't want to be touched to give your partner, even though you haven't talked to your partner about it yet, you're thinking about it yet. Those are big accomplishments. And so if we can look at that, we're not always just looking at our to-do list and what we haven't done. We're actually spending a portion of the day at the end of the day, looking at we, what we have done. And that's how change happens also. So as I said, newness is always on the horizon and newness gives us something to look forward to, something to be excited about. Um, and we're always meeting that horizon every minute of every day. This moment, in fact, was a horizon six months ago, and here we are. So keep that in mind, too, that you're always meeting the present moment, which was the future at some point, and you're always looking towards the future, which will become your present and eventually your past. And life is just happening and changing every single moment. So in order for us to end up in the same place together, on the same shore together, as opposed to drifting apart, we want to be conscious of the decisions we're making individually and as a couple. And we want to be sharing those with each other over and over again, so as not to be threatened. Um, if your partner wants to go, you know, travel around the world for a year, that can sound very threatening. Does that mean we're separating or getting a divorce and blah, 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 the chatter starts happening, as opposed to saying, wow, that sounds kind of cool. I'm thinking maybe I want to go too, or maybe not. What does that mean? Tell me what you have in mind. What would that mean for us? What would that mean for our family? How could we afford that? Where would you go? Could I come with you? Um, right? To get curious about it, then we start to open space for possibility. Oh, someone writes, I've had multiple partners prior to getting married. My new partner finds it really hard to accept my former partners, even though I've not had sex, sexual or flirtatious relationships with any of them for years. Any advice, please? Well, that sounds like your partner's problem. I'm sorry to say. So I don't know what about that is so threatening for him or her. Um, you know, sometimes people feel like they don't really want to hear about their exes. Um, I, for one, really don't talk about my ex lovers, ex partners with my husband. I don't see any reason to drag those relationships into my current relationships. I never have actually, when I break up with somebody, I'm generally done. So I don't end up being friends or having them over for dinner uh, because I figure if it didn't work out, it didn't work out. And I don't know what the need is for uh, bringing that back around. Now, I understand if people were married and had children with somebody, um, that person touched their lives in a particular way. And so it makes sense that if you can be friends and have a, a nice relationship mm -hmm. and everybody can get along together, I think that's beautiful. But it's not always necessary when you're uh, single and you have lovers to bring those into a marriage, for example. So part of it has to do with how you think about these people and how you hold them in your consciousness. But part of it has to do with your partner having to ask themselves, why, um, you know, they're so threatened by that, that you didn't uh, just pop into their life as a virgin, uh, that you actually had a life and life experience, which they may be the benefactor of actually, uh, before they met you. All right, so as we enter the new year, I want you to ask yourself, what, what changes are in front of you personally and professionally? What are the things you need to change personally and professionally? So I'm very well aware of some of what I would call character defects in myself. Um, and they become more glaring as I get older. And I start to see a lot of my mother's traits in me, which is always horrifying, right? Um, I certainly see all of her good and beautiful traits in me. So I want to qualify that. But I also see the things that I need to work against. And it's very difficult to work against these things because they are so deeply ingrained in who we are um, because of the way our brains and bodies are set up early on. 
um, because some of that has to do with our attachment style, which is really our regulatory style, how we regulate ourselves internally. So I am committed to working against some of those um, traits or features of hers that I didn't like and that I found unattractive and I don't want to impose on my friends and family. Um, and it's really hard. It's a difficult thing, but that's one of the changes in front of me personally. And then I have a number of professional goals. That's, those seem to be the easier ones um, facing me in this new year. And I think we're facing kind of an exciting time because we're starting to come up out of this pandemic, even though there's still issues and we still have to be careful and get vaccinated and do what we need to do to take care of ourselves and each other. But increasingly people are moving back out into the world again and we're interacting again in new and different ways. So this feels like an alive time, um, a vital time um, when we've been so cloistered for so long. So how do we do that personally, professionally? How do we do it responsibly? Then will these changes affect your relationship? Will they affect your sex life? And if so, how will they affect them? Um, and are you willing to do some writing about that so you can get clear about it for yourself? And also so you can start to communicate these to your partner. Um, I, I can't stress this enough that communication is probably the number one thing that makes a difference in whether people's relationships and sex lives stay intact. Um, and without that, you're going to get into so much trouble because everything starts to shut down and then we get resentful of each other and we start to blame and shame each other when really we only have ourselves to blame because we're not talking. We are not talking about what we want and what we need. And even if it's unusual, even if it's gonna upset the apple cart, even if your partner's not gonna like it, it's better to speak it out loud. And it doesn't mean that I'm gonna go do this. It, I'm not saying I'm going to travel around the world whether you like it or not, right? That is not um, taking care of the relationship. What's taking care of the relationship is I have something I want to tell you. I'm afraid that you're going to get upset or it's going to scare you or make you defensive, but are you willing to listen? And it doesn't mean I'm going to do it, but I really want to talk about it. So I have this fantasy that I could travel around the world for a year. And what do you think about that? Oh, okay. Well, tell me more right? Because I'm listening to understand you and I'm speaking to be understood. I'm not speaking to threaten or give you an ultimatum. I really want you to understand this experience I have internally, this wanderlust, this desire to see different cultures and eat different foods or camp out on a beach. I don't know, whatever it would be for you. Um, so keep in mind, this is a metaphor, this traveling around the world thing. Um, and, and offer that up. And the more we listen to each other from that place of listening to understand and speaking to be understood, which is Pia Melody's model, the more we can actually relax internally because it doesn't feel like something's being done to us or being taken away. And if you can do that, that's the beginning of having a really beautiful connected relationship where you can talk about anything at that point. Someone says, my husband has a massive porn and masturbation addiction, not in recovery and rarely ever has sex with me. It's been eight months again. Is there anything to even try or do? Or is there no point? I, I would say there's no point. Um, but if your partner is full blown in their addiction, whatever it is, and they're not making changes, your attention needs to be 100% on yourself. And the question is, what am I doing? What am I doing here? Why do I continue to stay? Why am I tolerating this? And what do I want for my life? And staying there and being bitter, angry, hurt, retaliatory is not okay because that's not gonna do anything for you. It's just gonna make you feel worse. So the sooner you can get help and get yourself out of that situation, the better for you so that you can start healing and start to have the kind of relationship you wanna have. But if you're settling for scraps, that's on you. And I'm not saying it's your fault that he's an addict or he's behaving in the way he is. I am saying that only you can get yourself out of it because you can't change the other person. Someone else says, I recently joined 12 Step for Love Addiction because an old lover came into my life after I broke up with an abusive relationship. My plan this year is to do a no contact for a certain time with my lover. 
Uh, we've discussed this. My concern is dealing with the withdrawal of sex. Do you have any books or methods to prepare for myself? Well, I would say um, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous will be able to help you with that. So your sponsor, your fellows and program will be able to give you um, a map, if you will, for going through that withdrawal um, and really starting to use other people to help you through it. Um, so that you don't have to just substitute sex because really you're using sex in order to regulate yourself. And that's not the same as being sexual with someone because you're really curious about them or you want them to know you or you want this deeper connection. It's about using it as a form of medication. And I would go so far to say as dissociation. Um, and so until you contact that deeper pain and look at why you've been using sex in this way, you won't be able to have sex in a way that's healthy and joyous and pleasurable in the ways I've been talking about. Um, I've heard it takes three to five years for a sex addict to change and be healed. Can you comment on that? Also, I've heard that 5% of sex addicts are able to really recover. Can you comment on that? Well, these are sort of general um, statements from the field of sex addiction treatment and everybody is different. Um, so three to five years is what it takes for marriages to heal, not for the addict themselves to heal. Um, I think somebody who's really working a program and committed to change and therapy and group therapy and all of that is distinctly different in six months to a year. Um, and people change over time and heal over time, but nobody's ever fixed. <laughs> None of us are ever fixed or completely quote cured. I think hams are cured is what somebody told me. Um, so be careful about that. And then, um, so the three to five years means both the partner and the addict are in recovery together and working together to get better. Um, and then I don't know about this 5% because there are really no outcome studies on this problem. Um, I just know that I see many, many people heal their lives and change their lives for the good. So it depends on the person and the persons and how committed they are. Someone else writes, uh, two years since my discovery day, um, my sex addict husband seems to be changing, but is back on a negative trajectory after a year of doing better. He's not acting out sexually, but he's violating my boundaries, hasn't worked the steps, is preoccupied with work and extremely self-righteous and pleased with how much he's changed for the better. He engages in blame shifting to the relationship rather than really working on the issues that underlie his addiction and current problematic behavior. Well, that sounds like a dry drunk to me. Um, so my statement to you would be that uh, you say to him, we either have to get into couples therapy together, or he should be in his own therapy for sure, or I can't be in this relationship anymore. But you have to be willing, all of you that are partners or all of you that are living with active addicts to draw a line in the sand. And if you don't, you have to continue to put up with this bad behavior. Um, and so where are your boundaries when he says he violates your boundaries? there have to be consequences for those violations and tolerating it and putting up with it doesn't do you or him or anybody else any good. Um, and so you should always seek therapy yourself so that you have support because oftentimes I know it's not easy to make these decisions the way I'm talking about, like I'm out of here. Um, it takes a long time to disentangle ourselves sometimes from these unhealthy dynamics, but the longer we stay, the more we have to admit that we're a party to the unhealthy dynamic because we stay. Um, so getting the help you need is really the only thing that you can do. Um, someone has said, is there a test to see if one has sex or love addiction? Yes. Um, if you go to uh, slaa.org, I believe, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, um, they have a self-report instrument on there called the 40 Questions. Um, and uh, you can also go to Center for Healthy Sex, which our URL is in the chat box, and there you'll find all the self-tests that are available to you. And just remember that people tend to over-report or under-report on self-tests, so you want to be as honest with yourself as possible uh, when you take these tests. Um, and someone says, where can I find a good sex therapist? I have child sexual trauma and I have trouble orgasming and sex with my husband. Um, if you go to asect.org, 
and that will be in the chat box also. Um, you can find a certified sex therapist through that organization. Heidi asks, can you speak to how shame keeps us stuck and how it handicaps us not to shame? Well, shame is what they call a barrier affect and it lives deep, deep in the body. We typically feel it in our gut. And shame prevents us from feeling joy, from feeling happiness, from feeling pride, um, from really experiencing vitality states in life. And so until we heal our shame, we're going to have trouble with being sexual, um, with feeling alive, with having fun, with self-consciousness. Um, it's a very big problem. And it's probably a core issue that everyone has who grew up in a household um, that was abusive. And so again, finding a therapist that can help us start to unlock that shame is crucial to neural integration and healing. Um, any of John Bradshaw's books are beautiful to help us start to understand what that is. Uh, he wrote a book called Healing the Shame That Binds You, which is a classic book for shame um, and easy to read. And then also Bradshaw on the family and another book he wrote called Coming Home, um, which is... Um, all of those books are enormously helpful in understanding the family of origin trauma and then the shame that ensues that we carry. All right, so we have one last question here before I wrap this up. So he's saying that he and his wife, oh, had hit a bottom and now they work programs together. They go to meetings, uh, they did the work to get the results um, on a daily basis, they've learned to be honest and open with each other and vulnerable. And as a result, they have a relationship that is so much more than just uh, penetration when it comes to sex. So that's a beautiful um, report. Thank you, Robert, for sharing that. And thank you both for doing that work. Um, that's a lovely message for us to um, start to end on here. So I want you to think about creating a vision board with your partner um, and have them do the same, actually. So you each create a vision board for the kind of life you want, the kind of sex life that you want, and then share those with each other. And then what are the non-negotiable items on your list? What are the deal breakers? How do you resolve the conflicts between the two of you? And make a commitment to talk about your vision for your life, as Robert and his partner have done. Um, at least once a year, no matter what stage of your relationship you're in, whether you're just beginning a relationship and you're wildly in love, or you've been together for 30 years and you love deeply, but it feels like things need to change again. So what are we going to do now? Who are we today? How are we going to enliven this relationship so we can keep changing till the day we die? So thank you for a very lively and beautiful conversation. I hope you all embrace the changes coming towards you personally and professionally in this new year. Um, happy holidays to all, and I look forward to seeing you in January.